they short attention spans are useful to control people not for liberating oneself you're going to need to expand your attention span speaking of which ld are you keeping an eye out for our guest i am excuse me and there's somebody of that first name and if that's you would you raise your hand because i'm not sure oh yeah Oh, oh i see wait a second there we go he identified himself it's all getting figured out right now on the fly as we do it live this is exciting all right so um he's here yeah using tiktok going forward i've never used like i I don't have tiktok i don't have facebook never had a facebook account these sort of things but i see people around me getting sucked into those things and when i asked them like hey what are you getting out of that like the questions could be answered with oh i'm gonna be famous or or something like that so it's like maybe we need to aim higher too maybe that's why we have journalism at an all-time low because people accept it instead of aiming higher and saying i want and deserve something better maybe that's it for themselves and for the world you would think but uh you know that's why you have to get to the youth at a young age it's that famous slogan uh give me a child until he's seven i'll show you the man something of that nature sometimes attributed to certain jesuits other times attributed to other individuals oh, it's, but, it's but, been passed around by useful dictators right, through the ages whether it's the it's jesuits true. lenin's got a quote like that there's a whole yeah, bunch of quotes exactly. to that effect and uh yeah controlling the minds of the youth is uh it's it just tells you a lot of today. tells you a lot about your enemy that they aim like the the least among us the youngest among us the least defended you know and they seek to remove them from the house and indoctrinate them for long periods of time but in order to undo that you have to elongate your ten- attention span you have to point it at things maybe available for consideration in your factual actual historical picture of the world i like to do such things and enrich my mind on a regular basis and i had been keeping an eye on uh Reiner Fulmix, uh, German lawyers doing this investigation and interviewing people for like the past year. And then they started doing the, the grand jury. And I woke up one morning and I had several emails to this effect. They said, you have to check out day two of the grand jury and you have to watch Alex Thompson's presentation because he talks about GCHQ and Kroll Associates in South Africa. And that's what got me there. But I didn't stop after I heard Alex's presentation. I heard the next presenter and I was even more pleased with this presentation. His name's Matthew Eret. I had no idea that he existed. And after watching that presentation, I was like, oh, we are all like going to be good friends in the future because we have identified from multiple perspectives, similar things, and we should trade notes and useful tools and resources. And do you know about this document? And, you know, I'll look at that one. And I just sensed like a great growth opportunity in those just first two presentations for the truth movement. And I couldn't wait to see what else is going to be in that grand jury. And I'm still trying to catch up on that as well. There's a lot of good evidence being put on the record lately. And I think that we not only need it now to make better decisions, but the future deserves to inherit a better, cleaner, truer, more factual, less propagandized history than we all inherited. And that's part of like the reward of the struggle we're going through is leaving it better for the next generation than we inherited it because we got it in the world of jfk and all those things that richard gage just said jfk uh watergate uh iran contra bcci uh waco uh ruby ridge okc all the way up to 9 11 without anyone being held accountable so i don't think we should let tyranny perpetuate into the future on resisted and i think that more intellectuals like matthew need to be johnny on the spot like this and get their word out so i wanted to offer this platform and uh first meet you pleased to meet you matthew how you doing hey pleased to meet you too richard uh, i'm doing very well thank you hi tony hi it's a pleasure to meet you as well incredible hi. work i've been all over your websites recently um, a awesome. friend of mine showed it to me and i was the the cover the fact you cover so many different topics and you also get into ancient history as well from so many different authors like i just it's incredible i've been yeah. really diving into a lot of the articles uh, i had like 30 really tabs open it. from clicking oh i'm interested yeah. in what he because i didn't know so i, <laughs> I have it yeah. up here i have like well, a so it's one of these problems right when you start realizing that everything is connected and that everything is just sort of different aspects of the same ultimate uh story then it kind of gets you onto so many different parallel paths that seem yes. very uh, different at first until you start picking away at it and you realize the source is the same. Yes. Um, Got it. So, yeah, no, it's, it's, I'm glad that you guys are, are uh, responding well to, or resonating well to it. Yeah. And then I had this book set on my desk to remind me because I just got this. This is William Dalrymple's 
uh, the company quartet on the East India Company. And I'd watched a bunch of talks by him. And I was like, I got to get that book set. And at the same time, I went to Amazon and I put all your books in my Amazon cart too. But then I asked the question, does he offer them directly? Could I buy them in a way maybe they get signed and you keep more of the money because you don't have Amazon in the middle? So what's the story with your books before? So I can take this off my desk so I don't have to remember for the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, thanks for letting me plug my book. That's a great, that's a great intro for that. You have many books, uh, plug them all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, you know, um, I, I've got a, like you said, quite a few, I, I did, I originally started off with a series of books that were the culmination of about a decade's worth of work on a Canadian history project. Cause I was, I'm here in Montreal. That's, that's where I'm based. And, um, you know, I, I got into some political activism for quite some time, but it was a U.S. organization with a, a small Canadian outlet uh, without a strong sense of what the hell is Canada? Why are we a monarchy in, in the Americas? Why didn't we join the American Revolution? Like, wh what is the deep state in Canada? That was sort of a, a term that's obviously people have started utilizing more and more in the last few years. So to piece things together, we started a, a Canadian history project. And, uh, and that started by just answering the question of why did Ben Franklin leave uh, disappointed after five weeks of mobilizing here in Montreal in 1776. He was up here, you know, trying to get the 14th colony to join and say together with the other 13, we will declare independence and create this new type of government that had never been seen that rejects heredit hereditary institutions. Um, so why did we fail to accept that challenge? So that was sort of the, the, the big question that kickstarted the project. And then from there, that took us into other questions like why did our rebellions we had republican rebellions in the 1830s a couple in, in english speaking and, and french speaking canada both of them were subverted by <laughs> I, I heard the reference to uh, or the allusion to bertrand russell or at least the the jesuitical reference mm -hmm. and um and getting them when they're young but bertrand russell's grandfather was in charge at the time at the british british east india company and the british british empire of suppressing the canadian rebellion so what was that story about? Then what, why did Abraham Lincoln's allies in Canada who were, who, were, uh, who had found themselves in very high positions of power and influence in the Canadian government in, during the Civil War, why did they fail to achieve an independent Canada at the end of the, that Civil War? Why were they ousted? What, why, why was um, a, a Confederacy, a, a, North, a British run Northern Confederacy brought in instead of us becoming a Republic when that was, uh, everything was moving in another direction. So what was that story about? And then up throughout the 20th century, what was the role of the round table, these British think tanks, the Fabian Society, how did they shape the, the, uh, the policies, not only of Canada, but of the, of the entirety of North America throughout the, the 20th century, using a lot of Carol Quigley's work helped enormously. I know you guys have, have also talked a lot about Quigley. Um, that helped piece a lot together. And uh, from there, answering such questions like, well, what is British Canada? Why have we been used to run assassinations of people like Lincoln from Montreal, which is where John Wilkes Booth was deployed to kill Lincoln? And what about the case of JFK, whose Permindex, I mean, Mortimer, the, the figure who ran uh, Permindex Corporation, which was identified by um, uh, Jim Garrison, the district attorney of New Orleans, um, who ran the only jury trial over the death of JFK, he wrote in his final book on the trail of the assassins, uh, he sort of compiled all of his 30 years of research and put together the picture that had uh, Permindex, a, a Montreal based organization, which was formed during World War II as sort of an assassination bureau that grew out of this thing called Camp X. Yes. Uh, this is at the heart of a lot of assassinations, and this is what was at the heart of killing JFK. Again, Montreal. So what the hell is this thing called Canada? So we, we published these four books, uh, or I published three of the four. Um, those are available on my website. And then more recently, this year, I published um, with my wife, uh, Cynthia, The Clash of the Two Americas from 1774 until the present. And volume three should be out pretty soon. If people want to not buy them on Amazon, you can get The Two Americas from me directly by sending me an email to um, info at risingtidefoundation.net. Um, I can throw a little signature in there if people want. Otherwise, unfortunately, Amazon just made it really convenient for me. And I, I feel a bit of disdain using them, but eh, that's, what I, that's what I did. No, I understand that. I understand that. And uh, I've got Permindex here. Not, I didn't do a whole lot of research on it, but yeah, the idea of, uh, I think, yeah, I was going to mention Clay Shaw. Was that someone Garrison associated with Permindex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's on the yeah. board. He was on the trademark uh, 
board of directors and uh yeah he's definitely tied to louis mortimer bloomfield on permadex yeah. yeah okay so um the angle on permadex is interesting because you brought up camp x and yeah, i know about that, camp yeah. x yeah. And I had just listened to a really good interview a couple weeks ago on Camp X before I went on maybe Grimerica or one of the podcasts I did. They had just done this whole thing. And I saw, I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll listen to that. Because I was like, what are they playing recently on the podcast? And check it out. And I knew a, a good bit about Camp X, but this guy was really in detail about that farm. And that farm is what was used to create the CIA farm training center, right? And Camp X was an assassin training camp. But we also have a camp here in America that was an assassin training camp called Camp David. It's called Camp David now. But prior to it being repurposed as a presidential peace type retreat, it was used for that type of uh, uh, mm. covert training, right? But Camp X opened December 6, 1941. The night before Pearl Harbor, it's ready to say, go and start training yeah. Americans to get into the war on the side of the British. And um, I had given this presentation a couple weeks ago that showed, like, I have the the memoirs of John Cecil Masterman, who was in charge of MI6 at the time. He's like, we were running Agent Tricycle and Garbo and these other agents, and they knew about Pearl Harbor ahead of time, and they didn't want to tell the Americans because it would it, like it spoiled the 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 spawning relationship they were just getting back together after this long departure and if they knew they were running all if the americans knew that the british were running those spies and knew about such things it would have compromised their ability to keep spying on us like they like it kind of has been so um the spies ever... set up the situation real quick whereby yeah, which we set up the embargo for the oil situation that caused japan to be incentivized to bomb pearl harbor with the sort of inability for them to gain the necessary oil they needed to fund their war effort. So like, it was actually all sort of, I remember that going back to peace revolution, like 84 or something like that. Yeah, but you went into you extreme about detail it, about like, how in which they helped to got, sort of develop the policy that FDR put in place that then, is, you know, well, FDR and his brain trust. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the way I see it is when America, so I was, I was really inspired to hear your perspectives, Matthew, because you don't live in the United States. And I was always looking at it as an American looking at the right. empire, but you're a Canadian looking at the empire. And Alex Thompson, he, uh, I believe that's his name. He's from uh, UK and he worked in GCHQ, which is like the predecessor and granddaddy of the, the NSA. So it was, it was really interesting and inspiring. And um, I thought this Anglo-American connection it does. It touches Canada a whole lot. And I really hadn't done a whole lot of processing on that. <clears throat> um, and that's why I found, that's why I wanted to get your books and get up to speed and be like, what's he know that we don't know over here and vice versa. What can we do? Um, where did you get into like the roads round table aspects? Did that show up in Canada too? Were there roads round table and Oxford scholars up there in Canada? messing with oh, you guys as well? well certainly yeah you can't understand anything about canada unless you zero in on the the yeah exactly now the the Rhodes scholarship the Rhodes scholars that whole hive of zombies who are indoctrinated and processed through the halls of oxford you know there's about 30 every year who are granted a, an indoctrination um fully paid for by the the ill-begotten gains of gains of cecil Rhodes. um and you know for those who don't know or may not know listening right now uh, cecil rhodes was a, a race patriot rabid uh most likely pedophile as well as everything else that he did uh sitting in rhodesia that's where the 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 area of south africa which today encompasses encompasses much of south africa zimbabwe a bit a bit more that was called rhodesia he was the governor and he ran things like a de beers came out of his um empire and he was uh he worked very closely with many leading race patriots i mean everybody who's higher up higher up in the british echelons are considered race patriots uh so-called in the sense that they would like the world to be exterminated of all impure races and only uh allotted space for the anglo-saxon pure pure breeds uh where maybe a few of the lower breeds are permitted to exist to do some of the manual labor you know so there's a lot of pictures of him being like carried around by uh by black africans um so he got he made a lot of money he had uh, a cup nathaniel rothschild was a big investor as well close collaborator with him um and he was recruited to become uh to, to set up a secret society as he writes it in his will which is, he wrote several wills but his his big one in 1877 served as sort of the guiding manifesto for how this Rhodes trust was going to operate when he died and how his his funds would be utilized 
So on the one hand, it was the Rhodes Scholarship System set up in order to, um, as he said, create a Church of the British Empire, a form of secret society in order to recapture the United States. They, I mean, the British Empire, even generations after the revolution, never forgave the USA for creating a new precedent of rebelliousness um, in the world. I mean, this was the only one world government after all, the, the sun never set for a very long time uh, around just this one little island. You're wondering how, how did this one little island control such a grand swath of global territory? And it's, it's because they had a, a very intricate multi-layered system tied to the city of London banking uh, complex, which just like today, even back then in the, in the 18th century, it was still the world's center of finance. It had an outpost that it, it had cultivated in, in many or in all of its colonies. It had outposts, uh, financial hubs, whether it was later on Hong Kong in uh, the outskirts of China or whether it was Wall Street that it had set up in uh, largely 1799 with the Bank of Manhattan founded by Aaron Burr, uh, who used money he was supposed to spend when he was vice president on a water project. And instead, he used it to, to found the Bank of Manhattan that became the basis of Wall Street. Um, <clears throat> So you had this whole international tentacle system with a very developed intelligence agency, a capacity to profile different courts, kingdoms, and uh, and personalities that would be targeted for dismantling or, or self-destruction. Um, if people want to get a sense of this, I, I always recommend read Schiller, uh, Shakespeare's Othello. If they, for a really good clinical case study into the mind of the, this type of intelligence apparatus, and just look at the character of Iago and how Iago operates from Venice, because Iago, this is all taking place in Venice. And it's, it's a little segue, but I'm going to get back to the round table. But, but Iago's character is somebody who everybody trusts as honest Iago. He's driven by something that is purely evil. And he just wants to destroy Othello, this great hero general, this, this Moor, um, who is, a, a, I mean, he's won multiple battles. He's, he has the love of a beautiful damsel uh, who just adores him, Desdemona. And he just plants little seeds of gossip and he profiles everybody's weaknesses. Where's Othello's point of jealousy, insecurity? How does he inflame that against Othello's own best friend who he gets to basically kill him and ultimately to kill his own wife? Um, so he's just able to whisper in everyone's ear and everyone just still trusts this bastard. Um, until all of these people, if they only would just talk to each other and realize how they were all being played and have that conversation, they would be able to, to break free of his spell. But nobody does that. They're all just so stuck in their own egos and they play into his traps and they all self-destruct. So Shakespeare is really just showcasing. He does this also in The Merchant of Venice and a few other plays to just showcasing the nature and the structure of this oligarchical parasite, which it's if you want to know the British Empire, really you can't understand it if you don't see how the Venetians which I was, was the former say, center. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's now we're their, getting into it. It's a critique of Venice, yeah, and the Venetian oligarchy that exists around them and also set up little Platonic and Aristotelian cults and these various things because the new translations were starting to come over. This is around the time of the Gutenberg printing press. I mean, there's so many things that were happening. I remember when I went over to Venice, you look at this, this the Senate room that existed in the, some of the old buildings there. It's really fascinating. Some of the architecture, some of the, uh, the, the arts and just the way they set it up it's very, I don't know, reminiscent of what we're kind of absolutely today. I mean, it's, it's exactly almost like it's like it looks like the exact same thing. Yeah. For, for a thousand years after the fall of the Roman Empire, this became from like 600 AD all the way up until like six, 16, 17, 1688, I would say. This yes. was a, a central point globally in maritime bullion control, maritime shipping along with Genoa. Yep. Um, yeah, Genoa, they had, the slave trade because the Genoese controlled the slave trade big time back yeah, I got in the some slave trade oh, over man, it's, it. they it yeah, was the secret society, hub. slave trades, oligarchy. I'm glad you mentioned that because it's really the model. It really is the model. And a lot of people don't realize that that because a lot of times people approach me and say, well, you know, you guys talk about the British Empire, but what about the Jesuits? What about the Vatican? Or what about this? What about that? And I'm like, well, I mean, we could it's really They're locating a philosophy story. or an ideology of control and power. That Should has talk, permeated uh, and transmuted. Venice or Lord Palmerston Zoo. Yeah, Palmerston Zoo is a class. <laughs> Those are both great pieces by uh, Webster Tarpley before his brains melted. Uh, yeah, uh, those were most of my favorite: the Black Nobility and the Venetian full, Conspiracy. Fulbright scholar Webster Tarpley. I always use his full title. <laughs> full title. Well, Fulbright as well, right? Senator Fulbright, another Rhodes Scholar. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> American no, version, exactly. wink, wink. Yeah, yeah. I just want you. You brought up the tentacles too. Uh, we can't. Uh, I'd be remiss if we don't mention um, British Danny Freemasonry. 
Oh, <laughs> well, okay, Danny Claus always sure, but British Freemasonry is a really sure. important sort of element too. Jessica Harlan Jacobs book, The British Empire and Freemasonry, is something that's sort of referenced. Where it but shows it's they set up the cultural elements. Posts, yes, where the and then they set posts. up forts, and then they, they, oh, it was Freemasonic lodges, then trading posts, then forts, you got fortified it. trading posts, and then they made it a colony, and there was like this step of progression. Are you familiar with that book, Matt? I am not familiar with that particular book, though it, I do find British Freemasonry fascinating. Um, and especially the Rosicrucian pre, you know, mm -hmm. pre Freemasonic -free uh, operations too are very, very useful to look into. And I'm just pre yeah. I'm preparing a presentation right now uh, that I'm going to have to deliver in a couple of weeks, and I'm, I'm underprepared. But I, I've just been delving into the uh, the the life and times, the geopolitical environment of Thomas More, like what was the world Ooh. he was living in, and uh, this has forced me to really confront a lot of these occult Freemasonic operations. Well, it was pre again Rosicrucian uh secret society operations that were being run within the courts of england at the time which is very interesting because it, it sort of leads you into what the hell did did henry the eighth the guy who had all of this potential he was trained by this by 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 thomas more um to be a continuation of his father henry the seventh's policies to break the venetian empire i mean henry the seventh was one of the key guys who organized who was part of the the organizing process that was going on in 1508 1509 Erasmus was a part of that. Uh, yeah, so was yeah. Leonardo da Vinci Machiavelli to create the League of Cambrai. And most so of the Medici's you know, were still in power at that point too. Mm -hmm. Medici, Medici Bank. Did you, yeah, 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 yeah. And Florence yeah. and so Florence, France, were a couple of the the core hotbed humanist centers that had understood the the nature of this Venetian Iago game that was getting all of these different kingdoms to kill each other. You know, the Holy Roman Empire just constantly. It was a divi I mean, it's like a 2000 prince electors and, and dukes, you know, fighting each other over small bits of territory, but they were also fighting the Spanish empire. They were fighting the, the English, the French, everybody's just fighting each other. And finally, you know, uh, enough people with, with some brains got together and realized, okay, we're all being played. That we're all being, all of these wars being funded by the same Venetian bankers. And it seems like we're all following the, the guidance and, and uh, dossiers kind of like these Soros funded international, um, I, ICG, uh, International Crisis Group type of profiles of each other's like operations. And they're all being provided to us, these different profiles by the same Venetian ambassador systems. And like, wait a minute, why don't we just like stop killing each other? And maybe we can create a league and actually just deal with this parasite here that's that's trying to get us to, to annihilate each other. And the, the League of Cambrai is set up, which involves the Vatican. And I mean, everybody finally for two seconds works with a common cause to destroy the entire Venetian fleet. And just before they can go in with the second thrust to finally wipe the center of oligarchical command, these old bloodlines, right, that had managed the, the, the Roman Empire before that, some of them probably go back to Babylon. Before or Phoenicia, this, or I would think, yeah. Phoenicia, that, or something. Phoenicia, I would imagine. Maybe before that, yeah, elements yeah. of that, I mean, it it's gets mar these the further time. back you go. It does, huh? it does, yeah. Uh, I was gonna say, yeah, for good. But yeah, right before they could do that, all of a sudden, the Venetians being really good uh, rat bastards are able to manage a bribe with the Pope who pulls out of the League of Cambrai, declares war with um, the, the, the Holy Roman Empire, which has to go with the Pope with, with whatever he does. And all of a sudden, they have, they have a new alliance that they create with Venice, and they also declare war in France and Florence. You know, <laughs> And all of it just disintegrates, but it's a wake-up call for Venice who realize they, they basically realize they need to get into a more strategic center of, of, of command. They can't just stay in this area of the lagoons of Venice anymore. Right. And they get their eyes set on partially Amsterdam, which is a, again, again, a very uh, creative zone. A lot of discoveries are happening. Uh, revolutions in arts and manufacturing are occurring in, in Amsterdam at this time, but also in, in England. And they, they are like, those are the two areas that we have to take over corrupt from within like a like a virus takes over a host cell and then uh use that as our new staging operation for reconstructing this new global roman empire which was always the vision is this re restore the, the roman empire and keep it that way don't tolerate things like christianity or or other things like that this time around and just keep like a, a paganistic scientific humanism of some sort which is where the enlightenment kind of grew out of a lot of these rosicrucian sects um so yeah exactly. henry thomas more and henry the eighth's court is is very interesting because it's a center of battle over whether it's going to be a driving force to revive henry the seventh who was a good king uh his policies or would it become this empire right that that involved driving henry the eighth 
profiling him, seeing his his sexual weaknesses, um, his arrogance, as he had a godlike ego, and, and he had some advisors that were stationed right right around him. One of them was Francesco Zorzi, who is a I mean, tar player writes a lot about yeah, him he does. in his work, and it's you a know, fascinating have, character. It I just notice a parallel with maritime. Mm-hmm. Uh, powers like mm. Phoenicia and Babylon and ancient Persia, the Achaemenid Empire had an unbelievable amount of control. In fact, Phoenicia came up with the whole idea of phonetics and our ability to communicate and do trade using mm. uh, being able to sell a uh, spell out sort of consonants yeah. and vowels. Yeah, the, the phonics. Mm. So, From I mean, Phoenicia those... to Phoenicians and Venetians, maritime trade. Yeah, you got and the there Venetian does seem connection. to be a history. And then the like British. You, well, if you read so. Zarlinga's mm. book, The Lost Science of with Money, maritime powers. you can follow it through. Uh, that's another angle on it. But, but I wanted to but, ask but, Buck, Buck, what's, this guy, what's this book? Buck you're, you're, Fuller talked about it. The Lost Good. Science of Money by Stephen Zarlinga. Oh, yeah, I have that over here. And he published um, Quigley's Evolution of Civilizations book because hmm. I correct I corrected yeah, myself yeah, on that earlier that. today. But there so is it was the also, one. let's not forget about the Venetian banker connection. They innovated this sort of double entry bookkeeping oh, yeah. as well. So, and that's mm-hmm. sort of based on the idea of credit debits, which is sort of like um, a callback to sort of a, a dualism in nature and the ability to sort of like rectify the dualism or find a balance between the two, which comes from sort of ancient mystery tradition. So there's a lot of like, you can play in so many different angles that it becomes. Well, and to, to Matthew's yeah. point, it's like uh, like the White House is a mixture of Freemasonic because that's a, a Grand Lodge over in Britain, but like the, the windows have um, like male and female symbols over the top, like moons and, and, uh, and chevrons. And that's identical architecture to what's in Venice. So what they've taken is, you know, there's you can trace lineage back to some of these things through the architecture that you're they're using to represent their current power. So I think there's a lot to it. And I wasn't planning to talk about Venice and Webster Tarpley, but this is a good because we know about this and we're we're still trying to learn and figure this uh, this whole evolutionary story of uh, what we've inherited today out. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because a lot of the strange architecture, the eclectic architecture of Venice, um, it, it 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 seems just so out of place. A lot yes. of it, and, and it's only when you realize that a lot a lot of this material actually came from their raping of Constantinople during the Fourth Crusades, which Venice bankrolled. You know, and people think, oh, yeah, the Crusades were all about Christians going to try to like win back the. Uh, the the holy land from the muslims and it's like no wait a minute constantinople was a christian uh domain it was the center of the orthodox church uh so what the hell did these christian mercenaries do <laughs> it, they didn't even make it to the holy land they just went and looted destroyed constantinople stole all of the relics and artifacts brought them to venice and uh just forgot to go to the holy land that's a whole story there, but uh, yeah, you no, know, the translations by Ficino, like Plato and Aristotle, and you have also um, uh, the MO tablet uh, or the Corpus Hermeticum. I'm sorry, the Corpus Hermeticum, which also gets translated. I think that was the first thing that they want to translate it first, and that all gets sort of pushed out into the European culture. Not to mention that the Crusades, the, fir- uh, the first or second sacking, I forget, in the 1204, there's a sacking of Constantinople, and then you get the influx of like Aristotelian principles and Platonic principles to Albert the Great um uh, albertus magnus who then is thomas st thomas aquinas's teacher that sort of begins the secularization process of europe itself because he separates natural theology from revealed theology now you can study philosophy again which gives you know only a century or two later we start to get the the burgeoning of modern the beginnings of modern science in the renaissance so you see how it all sort of connects but you're right it, it wasn't this you know them going to sack because uh, it was it was a it was a rape and pillage operation it wasn't under the guise of this sort of uh movement for holy uh, divinity or something of that nature in regards to the this false idea between christians and muslims and uh and then the war set up yeah that was to galvanize the people um in order to do it but that wasn't the real purpose yeah and i mean venice too which was the earliest to print i mean a lot of the the hermetic works and and also like just Gnostic works, Kabbalistic Gnostic, works, yeah, God, uh, were published and and utilized by the inner sanctum of, of Venice. And I mean, here's I think the interesting thing that I'm pretty sure Tarpley gets this point across. Otherwise, I forget where I learned it. Um, but that you you know when they were trying to figure out how do we take over or get into a safer, more strategic zone of operation um, where they had their eyes set towards the British Isles, hmm. um, you had a big fight whether between these factions the the older, the older school factions that wanted to just keep doing things as they had been doing them for hundreds of years, which is just suppress 
this, the power of creative mentation in your target audience, just suppress truth, suppress scientific discoveries yes. and, you know, call, call scientists, heretics, burn them if need be, uh, just crush it. And then the other grouping realized that that's a little bit overly messy and the gene kind of already blew out of the bottle and you can't really, it's not so easy just to put that away or force it back, back into the bottle. This is like during the time after the, in the wake of the Renaissance, where it right. became through, through the teaching of orphans, you know, like kids who weren't born of noble blood, kids who, you know, didn't, didn't even know who their, their parents were, were being trained by the brotherhood of the common life through the various monasteries to uh, learn ancient Greek, learn Latin, translate. And as they did that, they cultivated within themselves, their deeper powers of, of their own natural genius. And they became the intelligentsia that was working in opposition to this dark age faction uh, that wanted to just bring back this feudal, you know, system of master slave society. And people like Leonardo da Vinci came out of this process and was making pioneering breakthroughs in every single field he put his mind to, whether it was astronomy or, or engineering or the arts, painting, music, uh, architecture. Breakthroughs were being made because he had access to his his full self conscious creativity. And it was not just him. He was a, a good, ep, like a paragon of it. But there, this was like blossoming and institutions were being created to carry it forward to more generations. This was like a moral threat to the empire. And so while one group was like, no, no, we just got to smash <laughs> the other grouping, which was the the young, the Giovanni faction um, around this figure named Paolo Sarpi realized, well, no, I think we need to take a more subtle um nuanced approach here guys <laughs> and basically they were like well if you can't destroy we can't destroy the discoveries directly we can, what we can do is say we love the discoveries we could say we encourage them we're actually the, the 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 team of discoveries that's us and then we'll repackage them and tell and and control the narrative of how discoveries happen and we'll call it empiricism we'll say the way discoveries yes. happen awesome. is you use your senses Maybe you get lucky and an apple falls on your head and then a formula that describes how the rate of fall of the apple can be created that people can memorize and repeat to get an effect. But the actual cause of the, dis the human discovery that went into it, we'll just extract that so nobody ever gets to learn how that works. And they're just repeating formulas thinking that they, are, they get knowledge. And, uh, and that really did a, a lot of damage. But that's what became the dominant force in and, and this also explains why a lot of the the leading uh enlightenment thinkers like descartes uh, were also rabid um mystical freaks like they were all yes, into gnostic were. rosicrucian mysticism because they themselves weren't great discoverers they were just synthetic cardboard cutouts who are created because somebody has to have made the discovery right we've already killed or at least obscured the people who were the we've just the da vinci's the kepler's the Huygens, the Fermat, sure. all the great discoverers, we've just, we've obscured them enough. We've stolen their discoveries. We've given it, we have to package it now re and create it. appropriate yeah. it. Yeah, reappropriate yes. it and associate it with some dyslexic, amoral freak, whether it's an Isaac Newton who was into black magic, alchemy, witchcraft. And that's not me. I'm not slandering. There's, there's Isaac arguments that he was a pedophile and stuff. Like there is this possibly. strange, yeah, possibly. Like it's when you look at the, and then there's the war between him and Leibniz, uh, which is sort of artificially created and set up. I mean, at war least of calculus. In, yeah, war. Yeah. Oh, just like the where where it came from. And but to your point, Matthew, I mean, just the the, the idea of all these different. Most of the great thinkers were into very uh, secret societies, Gnostic ideas, uh, uh, Rosicrucian ideas. Uh, hermetic yeah. ideas oh, platonic right. ideas aristotle yeah. i mean it's just and aristotle interestingly enough was sort of a champion of induction and the, and the inductive method is what that sort of generates that yeah. creative capacity you know it's so as they go about and thinking about the world and experiencing the world and coming to some but instead they imposed a sort of deductive hegemony on it which is said no we, we come up with the solutions now here's how the world here's how we're going to dictate the truths that are coming into the renaissance that have already started to sort of permeate from the 12th century onward or 11th century or excuse me the 13th century onward you Looks know like you, you maybe think of an, an analogy real quick of beatrice webb like the or and the fabian strategy like the Fab, the great fabian strategist beatrice webb I, i'm forgetting the other one whereas oh. one wanted to kill him with kindness one wanted to just kill them and so it's like, how do we how do we mix the two together? And I just thought of that analogy when you're talking about the uh, <laughs> what was going on with the, the Venetian hierarchy in regards to how to manage it. Yeah, right. Sarpy's uh, secret society, I think it was called the Venetian Dead Souls Faction. And that source well, of that would he be... He didn't call Kurt it that. that. I think no, that's no, what... Uh, right. that, I was going to say, that's Tarpley's 
Gollum of Venice presentation that I put that in there from. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's appropriate. That was an appropriate name. Sharply, Sharply, uh, <laughs> Harpley, <laughs> Harpley gave it. Um, yeah, no, I, I think one thing was that that's super interesting, and I uh, I had the opportunity to read a lot of these original texts. Uh, it was it was it, I mentioned at the beginning that I was in the Canadian branch of a U.S. based organization. It was with the LaRouche organization back in the day, and, and LaRouche recently died. I think at the age of ninety six in two thousand nineteen. And so it was the Canadian. But in the course of that, I, I was in that uh, organization for about a decade. And one of the, the good things that I really appreciated was this focus on reading original source material. So for a couple of years, myself and a few of my, my Canadian younger uh, friends were, were working through Kepler's works. And one thing that struck yeah. me was that Kepler, in the course of writing his Harmony, uh, Har Harmonici Mundi, The Harmonies of the World, where he discovers his third law, of planetary motion, which is then later uh, repackaged in the form of Newton's inverse square law. But this book, he proves, he works through the harmonic uh, orbiting, the, the, of, like the reason for why the orbits of the planets are where they are, based upon a harmonic theory that had been first developed or publicly in, Pla in Plato's Timaeus dialogue yes. 2,000 years earlier. Right. And he actually takes Geometric this Geometric proportions. Using, yeah. Yeah. And using like the Pythagorean monochord, using certain strings and frequencies, you're able to then get certain relationships. Yes. And utilizing the, the slowest and fastest uh, moments on every orbit, you're able to then get certain ratios that are in harmony with these, uh, basically the, the major and minor scale. That's and right. from that, his his third law, um, which is I think in in short form the the the, uh, the the cube of the mean distance of every planet to the sun has a certain relationship to this square of the periodist the periodic uh, time of like one single orbit. Yeah. Um, so it's a square cube re relationship. It's a square cube yeah. relationship. Yeah, three three um, two D. That's right. Yeah. And at the end of that, he has a whole attack on Robert Flood, and so Robert Flood is the founder of. Uh, he's one of the leading, I mean, the founder of, of, of Rosicrucianism, as it is say, known. Because it's, yeah, the Christian Rosenkreutz for those, I think that's the, that's not a real person, by the way, no. that was, no, yeah, yeah. that did not exist. So people <laughs> would think that Rosicrucianism was started by, no, that's like a symbolic figure. It was Robert Flood and a couple yeah. other individuals was escaping me because I haven't studied Rosicrucianism in a bit, but I do remember that. John feature. John D plays a role. In yeah, that. John D, who is an interesting uh, and dubious figure in history as well. When it comes dubious. to Matt, yeah, like that dude's yeah. sketchy as all hell. But oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Your point. It's, it's I mean, this is stuff that you know, was when, when you actually read when by reading Kepler, I was so shocked. I had heard mm -hmm. of Robert Flood because I'm a conspiracy theorist. You know, that's just sure the name hits you when you're looking at this, though, right? Yeah. But then here is here is Kepler actually like a destroying Robert Flood. He's like openly who, who lives in his lifetime. Right? right. And Robert Flood, remember Fr Francisco Zorzi, Zorzi, the guy who's yeah, like Zorzi. brainwashing Henry VIII and inducing him to go and create a schism in the church and create his own church and just to get a divorce um, and get laid. Yeah. Um, Francisco Zorzi, uh, he's the one who is the godfather, the inspiration for Robert Flood. He writes a book in 1540 called uh, Harmonies of the World. And it's it's like this really esoteric Gnostic version of witchcraft, basically. Yes. Um, and so this is where partially Kepler is running um, a very high level cultural warfare operation against this whole parasite by calling his book The Harmonies of the World, but doing it right actually demonstrating and showing you how his mind is working every step of the way. And right. if you go through it, you realize he's not just using only deductive and only inductive reasoning. He's using a little bit of that, a little bit of a little bit of the other, but he's doing something more. Retro so it's not just a combination of the deductive and inductive or a priori, a posteriori methods of thinking, you know, sure. Um, I don't, I don't, I feel like I'm talking above maybe people who might be listening, but just to be quick, Oh, All don't, I need don't, to say, don't, don't judge our audience like that. No, I mean, I, it just happens kidding. sometimes where people are like, <laughs> it's the I'm, first I'm time they've heard about logic Kepler for the audience in this, so episode, in this, this, in this podcast, but it's not beyond yeah. their grasp. Please yeah, give them. No, yeah, no, but the deductive, the a priori, a posteriori thing. That's, that's so basically analytic well, synthetic. Con, I mean, yeah, like one, basically you start with, uh, with sense perception, a, general a to specific like, and specific to general and it's a convection current. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That you use that internalize the things that exist and like law is the adjudication of the specific to the general right because the specific incidents happened and then in the general they compare it to what the law is and then the adjudication goes on to the judge and that's kind of what your brain does 
Yeah, like you have like common law and civic law. Like so civic law, the French law m would have more of like an a priori uh, I approach where it's like you start with the, the general rule. Principles just, and then you deduce from there. And then you, then you use those to guide how you judge the the particulars. Whereas the, the common law, like you just mentioned, would be like, yeah, you've got these particular case studies and then you generalize to a, a, a rule from or a general principle from this particular yeah, so case studies. For the audience at home who might be lost, we start with in the latter, the common law, you start with that which exists and then you go to how does that relate to general concept and the a, a priority, which is like the, the Descartian French thinking, you start with the idea of the rule and you see how it does it compare to reality. But it's really a convection current in both ways can work as long as you understand freedom is like but to exactly. your point, Matthew, both, there's something more to that. Yeah, there's there's something more there. And yeah, there's, continue. There, there's retroduction. We could talk about uh, sort of the apophatic. There's also the idea of uh, analogy and relationship in the context of Plato standing in, into like a, a more transcendental principle, if you will, from which, but that's done through apophatic or through retroduction or through negation, through negation, which is a whole. Negation. Yes. yes. Yeah, and, and also the question of metaphor, like the poetic yeah, quality. Metaphor. Like if I say I've got butterflies in my stomach, you know, that, that, you, that it sounds absurd. <laughs> right? How do you I'm get like them nervous. in there? Huh? It's like a, How do I get like there? Exactly. Vaude <laughs> the vaudeville <laughs> acts where they cough up like nine frogs or like uh, David Blaine did that on Rogan too. Maybe yeah. recently, but <laughs> butterflies, frogs in the stomach. That's but it has no literal uh, or linear connection whatsoever to the actual meaning that I'm, that everybody understands when I said that. If you're right. nervous, that's what you say. But then there's no literal com connection that's either deductive or inductive. It's, it comes from a different a different place. Right. And so that's having right. that additional uh, creative flexibility to leap outside of the known structures of what is what already because I mean if you want to make a new discovery, nothing that is known will help you make that new eureka that that requires a leap into some something else an unknown opposite. right It's an unknown and that's an interesting thing about many of the great discoveries in history is that oftentimes not only it's it, when you read the great mystics in history, sometimes it's like a mystic inspiration or divine madness. Like if you think about it from uh, what was it, the Phaedrus of uh, Plato, like this, there's some sort of like inspiration that takes place that transcends just simple uh, discursive reasoning that, that we think is the, the, the what manifests these sorts of ideas. But you know, that's a fantastic point. There's something more to it. And to think about, I mean, there's a I'm rich turned this into a peace revolution podcast, but this, this is man, his name, David Harriman. He was a, 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 I think an objectivist philosopher, if I remember correctly, but he's a scientist and was a physicist. And he talks about this issue, um, the great discoveries in history. It's a little bit watered down or whitewashed, you could say, but he, he did make a book. good point. Oh, you he's have the book, a logical leap. And he, he champions the inductive yeah. method, but the bigger point is just the, the fact that in history, these, these, uh, these great discoveries weren't top down. You know, they were it's the inspiration. There was induction involved. There was just like uh, th there there is the, the recognition, as you pointed out, to um, these almost transcendental principles that uh, the, I, I think Tico Brahe was also a part of that. I was just going to say to Matthew Kepler point, as well, you know, yeah, Copernicus, Kepler, Copernicus, Tycho oh, yeah. Brahe. And there's a, a logical flow of one leaping off the shoulders of the next one into the but unknown. they show you the process right like that's what david proofs. harriman points out they show you that like how did they get like how did they think you get to see how they think how they thought and like that's what's arrested or anesthetized in modern schooling for children is like you're you're given you, you learn algebra what's up first of all algebra is separated from geometry you separate form from abstraction so you can't relate abstraction to form but then there's just the issue of like you're just you're you're given the the to your point, Matthew, like this is, uh, uh, you know, the, the formula for gravity, you know, here's the, the fall rate, 9.8 meters per square, per square, you know, like you get, we all, oh, we discovered it for you. You don't need to think anymore. Like that's, yeah. you're good. And that's that, that to get control of that, the SARPY sort of method, very, very deviant, very clever. Absolutely. So, yeah. No. And it, it treats you like a computer, right? Like that's yes, what you do that's with a the computer. Key. You, what goes in is what comes out. So you, you program the computer with certain inputs and it is limited to that. So how can yes. people fall into this cult of artificial intelligence that's so big nowadays, right? That's at the heart of this whole fourth industrial revolution. A big part of that is the belief that the linear uh, increase of complexity in computing systems, which is obviously able to calculate faster than the human brain, is going to make human beings irrelevant. And thus either we have to merge with them or accept this skynet type of matrix future right um <clears throat> so the only way you could get people to like actually chew and swallow that crap is if you can get their minds to be treated like computers so that they don't actually know what human thinking is because all they've been given is memorize 
repeat at, like a computer. And so they can't refute somebody saying, oh, but a computer can do this faster and thus you're going to be irrelevant. And they're like, oh, I guess I will. Yeah, shit. <laughs> who, put, who put the inputs into that computer though? What program the, exactly. uh, the, the if then statements? Because right? there was a question, I teach logic, I'm teaching logic to this, this community now. And okay. someone had posed this question to me, just going over like real simple basics of Aristotelian theory and in the light also some of the ideas of Plato as well, but mainly Aristotle, uh, just to start. I want to give them the basis before I get into the good stuff with Plato. But when it gets to uh, Aristotle, they're asking me a fallacy. It's like, you ever hear this fallacy called the machine fallacy? I'm like, what the hell is that? It's part of a metaphysical fallacy. But the idea is that, oh, well, we're just machines machines and that eventually computing power will overtake you know we'll, we'll, or we'll, you know in the girl um that douglas hofstadter sort of argument about recursion like we'll reach to a point where by which machines will become intelligent and i'm like that's the sort of fallacy misplaced concreteness where they're taking something that's purely abstract and the material that the human mind does and the volition associated with that to make choice and assuming that's going to be something that's going to be able to manifest out of a machine that we've not been able to do that because everything is a closed system feedback with machines so we can program the most complex ability for them to take disparate pieces of information that we have to input and then they can pump out all these probabilistic models that seem like that they're thinking but they're still it's like a, an artificial simulacrum of the process by which developed that. It's, it's almost like the sort of idea of emanation and standing in relation that which emanated is always going to be lesser, but you know, sort of a, it's like we're doing the same thing here. We're creating something or manifesting something that's like us, but it's going to be like a lesser form of that, something that's not going to be have sort of endowed with the same sort of ability or capability, that conceptual reasoning, which is a truly immaterial sort of, I say spiritual in the sense that there's no physical, it's like a field of a magnet in a way. Maybe they come up with like virtual pro photons in order to describe a field of a magnet, but it's like, no, it organizes matter. It affects matter, but it's a field effect. It's something that's immaterial. And there's something that truly transcends just the simple uh, understanding of what that, how that looks. So there's this, but there is right now this push, this push to push us into this sort of technocratic oh, transhumanistic model. They want, they want it more it than anything, but the, yeah. they know, the irony is they have to lessen that which makes us most human that conceptual capacity that you know descartes sort of the, the idea of the soul or the seat of the soul that sort of idea i mean um, i exist therefore i think to continue existing so but i understand what he was saying too yeah i can understand either. both sides he made I errors but he got his point though i get i get where he's coming from you know let so me, it's, let me ask this real quick because i know your time is precious matthew have you ever uh, read this book the out. fire in the minds of men origins of the revolutionary faith no i haven't oh my friend this book, it. i'm this ready book. i'm writing down so many titles in the in the short time i've been here <laughs> all I want, right i'm ready i wanted down. to offer massive value this is written by james h billington who is a Rhodes scholar and librarian of congress for the united states of america this is a gent right here very smart guy in here you're going to find like the official history from the library of congress on like the Rosicrucians, the, the Illuminati, right? This is like, it's an amazing book. I found this after yeah, I found uh, Quigley's Tragedy and Hope because I was like, who else knows about this stuff? And there is a particular passage here on page 231. I point to it often because in one paragraph, you can learn a lot. In 1843, B.F. Trenchowski invented the word cybernetics to describe a new form of rational social technology, which he believed would transform the human condition. In his neglected work, The Relationship of Philosophy to Cybernetics, or The Art of Ruling Nations, he also invented the word intelligentsia. So like a half hour ago, when you said intelligentsia, I was like, oh, I know where that mm -hmm. word originated and where the book is and what page it's on. And I wanted to make sure that uh, I got it on your radar. Because oh, that's a golden, that's a golden lead. I didn't, uh, and it's a fantastic uh, work. You're I really thought cybernetics was developed like a hundred years later by Norbert Wiener. Um, I got all Wiener's book too. And, uh, you know, that, I know all those cats, but this, you just this dated book, it by a hundred years earlier. That's, that's yeah. amazing. There's a lot of that. Going I think it on takes like etymologically too. from the idea of a helmsman. So it's like it does, being yeah, able to control of the steering, steering a ship or something of that nature, the sort of Kybernetes idea. Kubernetes, is, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. That not everybody on the ship needs to know what the ship is doing. All yes. the helmsman needs to understand what the whole is doing, and everybody else can just be hyper specialized in their local whatever mini job they have. And uh, that's exactly how the post World War II age worked. Uh, I wouldn't. I would. I'd be curious to know what this Trentowski's uh, relationship to the Fabian Society is, if any. I'm sure there is. If that's you want to. Um... Well, he was before the Fabian Society got rolling. I'll show him to you in the history. Yeah, 1843 is what you said. Hmm. Trentowski. I have him in here. His name is Bronislav. 
if because okay. uh, the BF part. And he's discussed. He, oh, we discussed him in uh, the Ultimate History Lesson with John Taylor Gatto, Hour Three. He's okay. one of the people. Uh, and if I have a second entry, influenced by Hegel, he was a Freemason. Mm. Uh, believed in the divine right of kings, part of mystery schools, uh, and yeah, a father of cybernetics. He's around the same time as this guy, Moses Hess, uh, Moses Hess. who okay. wrote uh, a very interesting book in 1861 that basically said, let's get uh, Freemasonry and some financing and use secret society to infiltrate Freemasonry, much like a, like an Illuminati type plan. Uh, but this was like around a time of the American Civil War. And um, it's called Rome and Jerusalem, the last nationalist question. Mm. And, and, and we're going to cut out this point. interview in a couple of days, like uh, the post-production crew will cut this interview out and put it out there. So don't feel like you have to take all the notes real time. <laughs> It'll be a replay. But I was just so excited on these various topics. So how old were you when you read this book? Have you ever read this book? And how old I'm, you? I'm rereading it currently the 1986 edition as we speak um because i wanted to get a better sense of the bronfman um Hoff, yeah Uden, you know there you so go I, ha I have the ah. 1992 version and that's like right. my original marked up version yeah. and then i also got this one because i like the subtitle better than this subtitle it I, works better to understand for people what's going on that's but, the uh, 2010 edition i think i think so yeah 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 it's the more yeah it's, it's less one. less meaty um i find but that title is better yeah, I mean, there's so many things in this big book, I call it, that are just fascinating and it's solid can be verified by other sources. And then, well, yeah, the, the forces last... of the oligarchy tried suing uh, the staff of EIR like 10 times and they couldn't get anything wow. across, like everything passed uh, the mustard every single step of the way. So they couldn't get this thing taken off the shelves. So they had to have uh, Lyndon LaRouche Theater and Saturday Night Live yeah, take them down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> have you had an opportunity to read this book? I own that book, and I have right. not read that book, though. All right. Do yourself Forward a favor. You. At least read the forward. That's what I'm saying. It's just, <laughs> it's just 30 pages. And then if you're interested in reading the rest of the book and understand, but it's William Yandel House, Road Scholar, that trains a bunch of American Road Scholars, has a big influence on America. I don't know how it translates into Canadian history, but I'm interested in finding out. I'll I'm tell really, you. Yeah. What do you got? He was also the uh, the teacher of uh, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, who was uh, sent down to Papa become Trudeau. one of Yandel Elliott's boys, uh, special little boys in uh, 1947 or so, before Yandel Elliott sort of talent searched him um, and then deployed him with letters of recommendation to uh, Harold Lasky in the London School of Economics. You know, just the, the for fairness. School, I wanted to show I do have that connection. I just forgot. Ah. There's, Yan there's Yandel Elliott because at one point I was I mapped out the students, but uh, you're you're Johnny on the on the spot with that. That's good. That's good. You understand Maurice Strong and Pierre oh, yeah. Trudeau well, and those no. guys. Yeah. Well, it's interesting about Maurice Strong. In uh, Ellen Dora wrote. Did you guys ever read uh, Cloak of Green? I don't really think so. I don't no, think we're that one. I gotta take hard to get. Yeah, no, we gotta take it. Yeah. yeah, Cloak of that was one of the most useful books. She was able to get exclusive interviews with Maurice Strong, and oh, yeah. uh, uh, over the course of several weeks, and it is raw. She went in there not knowing what she was getting into, and I don't know what caused her to ha have find the the courage to publish what she did. But she, uh, I, I mean, again, I, I won't say too much more, but in that there's one anecdote Maury Strong develops about how when he was still the, the president of Power Corporation, which sort of ran the monopoly yeah. for the hydroelectric power of Quebec, uh, he was like the youngest CEO after he was brought back uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation and he became CEO from a variety of things. But he describes how he was uh, brought in quickly to become a, a top controller and headhunter in the Liberal Party and had uh, fielded a bunch of, of potential talent um, and was on the selection committee that selected Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Like they, that's the way they kind of work with like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. You know, they, they look for people who've got a sort of look and can speak you know, well and, and can be marketed in the form of Trudeau. It was Trudeau mania. They just used the Beatles selling, uh, <laughs> um, literally they did. Women were like, you know, <laughs> like throw their right. panties at him and stuff. It was weird. Um, and he was on the selection committee with, um, Walter Lockhart Gordon, who plays a big role in the Dope Inc. book as one of the key architects of the global drug money laundering schemes through the Caribbean, Scotiabank, a lot of the, the Canadian banks that play a big role in global back then as well as today. 
uh, money laundering. So Walter Lockhart Gordon was the, the president of the Privy Council of Canada in 1965 or 66. Maurice Strong, uh, he became the, the, the head of external affairs, and then he founded the Canadian International Development Agency that sort of rewired how uh, loans to poor countries were going to operate on the condition that they all became uh, enmeshed with IMF or World Bank conditionalities. And so Kent, you know, Strong played a key oh, role in that operation. But yeah, he was on the selection committee with Locker Gordon to pick so they out sort of Trudeau. devise the principles by which the IMF then later used as sort of the model, or they At, sort of worked hand in hand, or how does that connect? Hand in hand, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. People tended to trust Canada. It's sort of a weird thing that pe people of the world. Why is didn't. that? Yeah, because like when we like, yeah, that's the perception I get. We didn't from deserve friends it. And family. <laughs> <laughs> if anything, uh, they seem like they were the branch, the northern branch of the British Empire that sort of, you know, utilized well, the Germany against the, the against us and the well it was this middle power thing right so that was yeah, middle that power was, is a great word description yeah that was the the model that was adopted um i mean i'm sure yandel elliott a lot of these discussions happen because you're like wondering how could one guy like yandel elliott produce such diverse students and prodigies like henry kissinger and <laughs> zbigniew brzezinski and then trudeau who's like meeting up with castro and uh, mao and and also befriending reagan and stuff and you're like what the hell is this weird chameleon type of thing? And you, the, Trudeau was asked one time in 1969, what is your, uh, how would you describe your foreign policy? And his answer was simply create counterweights. Nobody, not many people understood what he was saying, but he, I mean, you know, he's, he's a puppet, but he was a smart puppet. He understood right. what the, the nature of the game was. So anytime the Cold War is all based upon this idea of a mathematical balance as much as possible, it was a Manichaean dualism. Yes. And so if if the the geographical or the ge, uh, the gravitational center shifted too much towards the Soviet side, then you sort of befriend the Americans and the capitalists. And then if same thing happens, that gravity center moves over to the the capitalist side a little bit, then Canada throws its weight over to you know, hugging Castro or, or visiting Mao or something. And so you always just keep things in as much of a counterweight type of balance as possible as part of a broader great game. But you can't get this by looking at Canada itself. And that's where most Canadian authors and, and historians have gotten it all wrong, because they just like American authors, they tend to look at the world through a purely American centric filter. Canadian authors do the same. British authors, I'm sure, do the same. But it's it's so important to look at first the global chemistry as, as a higher whole. And then you can sort of make sense of the context in which the parts operate, right? And people like, you know, um, Trudeau, he was, for example, a, uh, a leading Fabian who was controlled by a Rhodes Scholar named F.R. Scott, who was his primary handler. Uh, F.R. Scott, along with five other Rhodes Scholars, S. Scott Reed being another one who was, a, mm -hmm. I would say, the, the major architect of NATO two years before NATO was created. Uh, this was uh, S. Scott Reed's baby. But these five Rhodes Scholars, set up in 1931 the canadian fabian society the league of, of social reconstruction and it had a political branch just like the the british fabian society earlier had its political branch called the labor labor party labor party yeah. um the canadian branch or the canadian political uh, party was called the cooperative commonwealth federation set up in 1932 as a way to create a scientific um organization of society right manage society under scientific management and you can have a better equal distribution of wealth get rid of private property all this all this stuff that we that's how you euphemized it even though it's really just a, a racist sort of like top-down yeah. system then you talk about race patriots they were utilizing the sort of new sign to the emerging darwinian evolutionary model and the x club and thomas huxley and all exactly. those figures yeah well they're all that's, eugenicists right exactly. and, and so exactly. uh Trudeau is brought back from Harold Lasky's control at the London School of Economics. He's given like this 500 day tour of the world in 1949 to just get a sense of like, it's like his, yeah. his training to see how the international appendages of the empire work before he's sent back to Canada in 1950 to be uh, positioned in the Privy Council office, which is sort of the, the nerve center of the, the cybernetics command of yes. Canada. It's the Privy Council uh, or the Privy Council office per se. And so he's there, um, his handler is F.R. Scott, one of the six or five Rhodes Scholars. Um, and this thing becomes, he becomes an, a member of that political party, which becomes, it changes its name in 1960 to what's called the New Democratic Party, uh, the NDP, which is sort of the, the third big uh, party in Canada even today. But they can't get political power because they're a little bit too Marxist and people, you know, Canadians 
aren't aren't feeling that it's they're just not there's a glass ceiling they can't break past so if the decision is made around this time in the late 50s to focus their energy on transplant kind of the way venice took over amsterdam and, and britain earlier they're they're like we're gonna do that same thing we're gonna take the liberal party which at that time is a very different beast than the liberal, liberal party of today it was still a party of progress the party of cd how large-scale you know, development projects, anti-imperialism, a lot of really good people were in that. Um, our Avro Aero uh, space program, aerospace, uh, nuclear power, like all of these cutting edge things were all being driven by that, that liberal party. So that was being purged. They, they started a process of purging it of all of those nationalists. And the guy who was in charge of doing that, um, and I've written a lot about that in, uh, in volume four of my Untold History of Canada, is Walter Locker Gordon. And uh, and he's he's the the kingmaker, and he's so so he's he's doing that, and they're infesting it like a virus would infest a white blood or a, a, a good blood cell, and um, immediately all of these NDP Fabians um, switch over like like Pierre Le Trudeau and and his entourage, and they become liberals, and they become then all of a sudden once that party is purged by 1963, they they take power. They you have a, a really inside out. From the inside yeah, exactly. out so people don't realize yeah change the people don't get that it's wolves in sheep's clothing that's and they exactly put it right the there in their logo know, they're right. like here it is it's in their own that's logo insane. That's insane. <laughs> i mean there's the fabian it? society oh. in, in london and uh a buddy of mine a tragedy and hope subscriber from years ago mike mitchum uh, i'm pretty sure he got us uh shots of the fabian society he's the one that shot the banksy gchq installation for us for the bill binney interview yeah i've got a lot of good stuff from him over there and so yeah the, the, it's like ld can you bring it up on screen it's like they're they're shaping the world to the image and it's like also wolves and sheep oh clothing. yeah they're crafting Isn't there two parts as, of it there's like they're crafting the earth so they're the demi and itself clothing. yeah and i was like yeah. why do you think they made this stained glass if not to be like hey this is our way of telling you fair play this is this what is we're doing religion. Yeah, well, it's, it it's, it's revelation of the craft it's revelation of the craft yeah. it's sort of yeah, they got it yeah it's kind of yeah. like they can do it if they tell you even if you yeah, didn't do the small print there it is yeah. yeah and one guy is sydney webb and the other one is is george bernard shaw it was commissioned by george bernard shaw this yeah. particular sydney webb and yeah bernard shaw and that's george the other bernard one they're holding the yeah. uh the earth in yeah, George Bernard Shaw uh, was a crazy kind of eugenicist. He was like, the one who just wanted racist, to kill them straight up. Yeah. Racist. I think that was the know. dialectic they played. It's like, well, yeah. no, we'll just kill him with kindness. Yeah, we'll just. That's the guy. And she put that. That's how I was thinking of Shaw. That's yeah, he, he literally, there's anywhere. videos of him on YouTube uh, where he's saying like, yeah, we should have a board, a population board where yes. everybody is forced to justify their existence once a year. And if they can't satisfy the reasoning of the population board, then off to the death chambers with them. <laughs> and he talks in this weird creepy british accent crazy yeah. population council yeah, these yeah. Are i mean like, it's like what about if he had to go in front of that board uh sort of a recursive yeah. function there it's like would they ever think about that well they're no, basically they don't do, <laughs> do self-reflection <laughs> self-criticism they don't <laughs> they're the influence for orwell's ingsoc english socialism in 1984 is just the front for the fabian society like that's his representation i think in that book mm. so there's, yeah, there's a lot to it. Well, the end of Elliot, I mean, they, starting was, with Fabius Maximus and the war of attrition yeah. strategy that they use. <laughs> yeah, that, by the way, didn't didn't succeed ultimately because the Romans hated it. They Romans. What happened is Trudeau took his sheep's clothing off and he's like, I'm taking your bank accounts because of the trucks. <laughs> Hong Kong. <laughs> Optimus yeah. Prime came. Down, he's right? an Aesop's fable walking right now. Tale for the future <laughs> generations. <laughs> Uh, no, it's, right. uh, yeah, it's really, I mean, that, that's the sad thing, right? Is that it, I, I heard you guys were just sort of making fun of the, uh, the dumbing down the mediocrity of even the messaging and the propaganda outlets where they're forced to bring these like bubblehead kids from TikTok into the White House. more and more like, into machines. That's what you said earlier. Yeah. Like, I mean, the, you look at just the quality of, of mental, um, degeneration between a Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the original and his son who's sort of trying to fill his shoes, living in his dad's shadow. And I mean, the kid himself, there's nothing there. He's like a young version of Biden. Yes, um, that's right. That's right. It's, it's almost like there's no soul, taking that in a very like loose use of the term, but there's like nothing there. There's no sort of inner sort of uh, like introspection, no, yeah. like reflection of their own consciousness or their own motivation. Like there's this self-reflection. Like, Do you ever they, wonder they, if maybe like, they put out no... the Sophia robot 
<laughs> when they already had Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and these cats out there, like that, that, you know, uh, Justin Trudeau among them, they seem kind of like the, the tether connections, not high speed, you know, uh, T one line quality, you know, they're a little slow. They're a little and slow. Yeah. Robotic in their reactions to us. But see, and, and so why do people fall for this and think like, Oh, you know, what, what a great, great guy this Trudeau is like he, he, a lot, he does have a lot or maybe he I don't know if he still does but he had a lot of support a lot of people think about uh they they listen to Mark Zuckerberg or they listen to Elon Musk and they're like yeah greatest geniuses of the world you know like why can't you see that there's nothing there like it's pretty okay. clear <laughs> these are programmed uh you know um, I think we're more like sociopaths. Like I don't the the, the ability for self reflection, at least from an empathetic standpoint, and the like. It does almost some argument can be made that it doesn't even biologically exist as part of those certain parts of the brain. But even if we go away from that, there's just something missing in the the concept of like substance or self reflection. Like I don't they don't have any sort of nuance. The fact that there's such a caricature of themselves, even and the way they present them. So it's just so strange. Like I, I, it, I think about this with so many of our own, like Nancy Pelosi is one that comes to mind in our, uh, in our government, like, and Biden obviously is he's, he's completely senile or he's putting on the greatest act of all time. Some people have posed that to me in our recent town halls. I'm like, is he really senile? And, you know, it's like, well, I mean, if not, he had the brain cracked open a couple of times and maybe they tried some of those implants, who knows? But at this point, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's very strange. The fact that people are willing to fall for it is that, you know, I, I've gone back thinking like, is it an evolutionary thing? If that's even a real thing, you know, that's a whole issue in and of itself. I won't get into, but if we say insofar as like, we have some sort of prime animal sort of instinctual behaviors, let's say like we follow the leader, we want to have a natural tribal leader being ostracized from a group. What is it that we're like willing to go along with these people that just are so devoid of basic Those consciousness the and basic survival. intelligence? And most people never change off the defaults. Tom. Defaults, yeah, it's like a default and, setting. And yeah. they also default believe Nancy Pelosi has something to do, and they have a connection to her because they voted for her. But really, those people in those buildings, they got there because of special interests and the the donors. And those are the calls, and those are the squeaky wheels they take care of, not the the citizens who, not the cattle on the farm on the ranch, yeah. right? So. What? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think a lot of this, and I mean, if this if this were an evolutionary, like a uh, natural consequence of just just the forces of nature, then I think we've got um, a philosophical crisis, um, mm -hmm. possibly a spirit theological crisis. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I consider it a philosophical. Yeah, I agree. A philosophical I agree. corruption of reality. <laughs> yeah. We, I mean, that's the whole, like, then God created a big joke that is uh, self-destructive by its own nature. And that's a big, I mean, that takes you into a bit of a black hole. Um, yeah, it's a big uh, metaphysical a nihilistical, issue. nihilistical, just like, yeah. let, me, let me just get some, like, cocaine right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, I agree. The other thing is the free will approach. Um, yeah. And because, you know, um, how do you know that, uh, would a loving parent allow a kid, would, would a loving parent not uh, love a kid so much that they would, prevent them from making mistakes is what a naive person might think. And you, cause you just care about the kids so much. You would just put them in a, in a little box so that they'd never fall down. They never try anything new. Cause that would cause them to, to screw up, you know? And so you love them too much. Would that actually be a loving parent? No, that's a tyrant. Um, exactly so right. like if, if human beings, if, if, if there Plato is defined that that way too, I'm glad you said it that way. He, <laughs> he, he defined a tyrant in that capacity, at least in many different ways. So that's one of them. I, that's a brilliant statement because it's still a form of control. You still want to control the ability for them to actually experience their own world and engage in their own agency as an individual. But yeah. it has nothing to do with the government trying to control you. There's no, no, <laughs> no connection between those two. Well, that's, but that's the thing, right? Like good, good government, good statecraft allows for free will. It'll, it obviously like you need to have laws in a sense. We got it, you know, there's certain structure, but at the same time, do you want that to be like, uh, an oligarchical tyrannical fascist state that just forces everybody into automaton status so that they're all well behaved. No, you want to allow for the freedom of people to try new things, to make mistakes. And, you know, there's a sort of balance of, of free will and duty that you have to sort of zero in on. Oh, we'll never maybe yeah. hit the formula perfectly. Cause if we did, then we'd become the robots and, or whatever, like and if there's they, a paradox, we, another one of these metaphysical paradoxes. Yeah, exactly. That themselves. Yeah. Yeah. But that's why I love the, 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 the yeah. concepts. When you read the writings of a lot of the founding fathers, there's a certain platonic uh, sensitivity to this idea of, of a constant self perfectibility embedded in the universe. Yeah. You know, the image of that perfectibility. We and participate that's why in it. Yeah. So yeah, that's why they're like called the perfectibilists. 
<laughs> well, that's, a, that's a that's that's across the pond i thought it was like man, i thought you were like lobbing it to me for me to hit it like that I didn't even... <laughs> that's brilliantly well said though that's they they did have a sort of platonic they we stand in participation of a higher order that transcends itself and there's there's a beauty a goodness and a truth that tries to emanate out of that but then there's also you manifest that paradoxically in a world of dualism through the separation of powers because of our own natural proclivity to sort of absolute where power corrupts but absolute power corrupts absolutely so how do we yeah. manage that innate that mind body dualism that plato alludes to you know plato says you have to come to know yourself right like yes Plato's that's like, the point yeah like yeah. don't start don't skip steps don't try to like become a ruler like when he's talking to alcibiades you know he's like don't just go and just try to run society and determine when you want to make war or peace without first having taken the time to know how your mind and heart work exactly. do that first and then do the other things and, and it, it we screw things up every time we skip steps every time we skip and people sort of confuse the issue of the plato's republic is thinking it's uh, i mean uh Par popper did this uh, terribly a whole, a whole book in this not soros understanding one teacher, aspect of yeah soros's teacher it's interesting uh they got the whole thing wrong because in book two i think he says this is nothing more than an analogy for the human soul and so when you go up the you know sort of the different uh caste levels of the the republic it's actually talking about us as individuals being able to separate ourselves from the foundations of power in many ways. So it's a, in book nine, it says this would be an impossible task. This is not something that would manifest in reality. It has something to do with about our own spiritual nature, which is an interesting function. People forget about that. Yeah. But everything that he yeah. did was cryptic, done by analogy, done by allegory. And I think it's because he probably was privy to the mysteries back then. And it was punishable by death, potentially, to reveal any sort of aspect of the mysteries which is why he had to set up a school and use analogy and myth and metaphor and, and allegory in order to try to describe these, 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 these ideas um, and why he's been so confused, even though, as William James said, that all of Western philosophy is a series of footnotes back to Plato, which is, that is, could not be more well said. And well, I, if you look at his, his, his letter eight and his letters, which are consciously mm -hmm. also out of sync, like they're, yes. they're out of chronological order, but his letter eight is really good because it's the only one where he talks with, I think it's, Dion, I'm not too sure. Or no, I forget who he's talking to. But he's writing how he'll never make literal his intention. Yes, had, you know, and it's it's a strategic design, and he's he's describing also his personal role geopolitically within a broader process that was underway in the world that he lived in. Because people, his mentor was killed. Right? Ivory Tower philosophers what was that? Wasn't his mentor killed? Um, yeah, that's yeah. that was a big one. That was a big yeah. life changer for him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you will never forget what the democracy uh, produced in that capacity. And also is railing against the oligarchy, which is an interesting facet, as well as I think uh, Aristotle to a degree, which is his, obviously his most famed student. So there is this elements of like the, the milieu that existed in ancient Greece that we can sort of transpose onto certain aspects, especially of European and modern history and the Americas that we sort of stand in a participation with and understanding like what was going on back then and how we can draw parallels to today. A lot of people draw from the Roman Empire, but I, I like to go back to ancient Greece, one, because I'm, I'm prejudiced to ancient Greece because I love ancient Greek philosophy, particularly Plato and Aristotle, Plato, Plato mainly. Um, but there's well, a lot that could be learned. Sorry, go ahead. Well, definitely. Uh... I, I don't know about the Roman Empire, but definitely it's useful to look at how because it's undeniable that a lot of the founding fathers were influenced by their studies of the Roman Republic. But a, right. before it became an empire and degenerated and the figure of Cicero is kind of like mm. the Socrates of, yes. of the Roman Republic. Right. And he described himself when people were trying to ask him, like, are you a Stoic? He's like, no, I'm not a Stoic. Are you an Epicurean? I'm not that. Of course not. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm a Platonist and his he's always trying to intervene to bring people into a higher uh higher. higher synthesis outside of this dualism of epicureanism versus stoicism which is what they all thought they had to jump into is one of the extremes and he was like no use your creative reason and he was always intervening stopping conspiracies like the catalan conspiracy yeah um and and trying to bring it back he could see that rome was degenerating kind of like socrates could see athens was degenerating Right. under Pericles to become an empire where it had backstabbed its allies and was becoming a more bloated uh, parasite. And he's like, no, we have to stop this. We have to push back against the sophists and expose them. The, yes. Those who try to make the lies appear truthful and, and get like Iago. Huh? Like Iago, like Iago, you mentioned like Iago. Yeah, we have to expose the Iagos. Uh, and, yes. and the same fate uh, befell in many ways Cicero, who was, you know, his death marked kind of like Socrates' death. 
the shifting morally into empire of Rome, where it very swiftly became republic to empire. That's a perfect yeah. analogy. Yeah, that's a that's a, that's a great sort of uh, analogy. I didn't like. I mean, because that that is exactly what happened. The Periclean age we call it the Golden Age of sort of Athens or, or ancient Greece, but uh, ironically, it had sort of this like weird dualism between Pericles himself, who stood sort of like, as an emperor. And then the Senate, who were constantly embattled, and it ended up in the Peloponnesian War, with Athens essentially being destroyed and subjugated uh, yeah, towards the end. And also a massive, interestingly enough, um, there was an outbreak of a disease that took place based on Pericles' strategy. I'll so build a the, wall the, all the way. Yeah, build a yeah. wall and put all the people together and see yeah. if like uh, we can handle that. Which which sort of strange to me is like the Platonists never saw the dualism as as being the metaphysical primary. They always saw it as contraries that had a sort of resolution. And if we could understand that, we can find balance and harmony between each ourselves. And instead, what I've noticed in the modern day is people have taken people like Hegel. And instead of understanding that process, we stand in participation with that. They reverse the process and say it's something we need to manifest later on. It's not something that already has manifested itself and we can like we can work out our differences. No, the differences are primary and through mm. like uh, essential it's because we can manufacture this, history we can manufacture instead of understanding that there is an emanation from a transcendent source they put the source at the end and we have to we have, now have a duty to get to that end and so yeah. you sacrifice the individual for this collective and that's not what the platonic ideas at all meant it's a it's a weird twist that happened that i think was born out of the scientism of the of the 15th 16th and 17th centuries the emerging scientism reflecting upon ancient ideas and so it's something i've been trying to trace because a lot oh, of philosophers man. have been that's the way you're I'm saying kidding. that is so useful i hadn't thought about but it's true and and if you think yes. about like what what is it about the perversion like the neocons i mean people i think generally yes. know that the neocons have a certain straussian heart yes, uh, at their origins which interprets these are self-professed platonists yeah, no, right. That's are my they problem. really right? Yeah, that's my yeah, thing like, is well, they got Platonism all wrong. That's the thing. Like if you read Thomas Taylor or you read, you know, the the Ficino for, for those that can actually understand, you know, this that this is not the original intention of the ideas. And that's why for me, I've been looking at translations of like how if you the various translations and the various sources that are available, it's pretty one, they're done within a secular scientist scientific sort of scientism framework where they secularize it and make it seem like it's more black and white than it actually is. These things are analogy, allegory, myth. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're artistic ways of describing phenomena that of general principles that must exist, but those general principles aren't particulars. But then on top of that, you have this weird humanistic sort of vision to your point about Amsterdam, the Venetian taking over Amsterdam, like where they, they twist the ideas of this new emerging sort of like humanism and this new emerging sort of idea of uh, scientific invention. And they combine it with this like very perverted view of ancient ideas. And you get this sort of like, uh, it's almost like um, the creation of the, the alien in Ridley Scott's universe, right? It's into the simulacrum <laughs> that is essentially the, uh, the worst manifestation of both ideas put together. Because instead, like it's, it's as if science theory, scientific theory took the worst and most misinterpreted elements of Platonism and combined them together and said, well, now we have a scientific duty to create the sort of I, sort of like misunderstood I, idea of an idealistic state yeah. or idealistic transcendent, whatever that would be. And that's codified in Hegel most specifically. Um, but that's not at all the, the, the original intentions. And I've been piecing this together and trying yeah. to build out a, not only an argument, but sort of an essay around the complete differences and there are many differences between between the, even though you can use Hegel you can look at Hegel and you can look at the fact that yes there are all these sort of, sort of cults that existed in Europe we talked about Rosicrucianism earlier we talked about we didn't even go into alchemy but alchemy and there's so many different alchemical sim, uh, symbols or, or systems it's sort of like the European misinterpreted recapitulation of ancient ideas in the light of a new ability of agency to take command of the world in the form of technology and scientific invention that's completely sort of uh, separated from any sort of true transcendent sort of spiritual connection and or the material world itself. And that that gets ironically, I know that seems weird, but there is like a weird twist there as to the way because the, the empiricist and rationalist both were skeptical. They both didn't believe that we could actually come to know truth. So they were skeptical. The empiricists were skeptical because we have a sense perceptual apparatus that sees and filters data. And the rationalists are skeptical because uh, we have consciousness and we can deduce from a priori conditions. So they both ended up in nihilism. Both yeah. schools ended up yeah. in nihilism somehow. Yes. And like that to me is some weird perversion 
and I don't, I've been trying to track it. Like it's been one of these weird things where it's like, I, I, I took Jung's idea where he thinks that like, there's this weird admixture that happened in the sort of the emerging scientism of the like 15th, 16th, 17th century, the early modern period, it's often called mixing with these ancient ideas and sort of justifying that we have a material control as sort of Karl Rove dictating that we can, that we now control history. We create history and the Hegelian sense that like we can take there, there really is nothing but a dualism to these people. Yeah. We can't really know reality. We can't know truth. And there's just these two dualistic elements that are constantly competing against one another. And so we're just going to weaponize those concepts and we're going to use it as a way to manifest the future that we, uh, we, we idealize as being whatever, but that's the ultimate issue of the ring of the myth of Gyges. It's like, uh, you know, you give someone ultimate power, what would they do? And then that's like those Rasimikas who put yeah, up the plate or Socrates. Yeah. yeah. Well, I uh, thought I of gonna... manufacturing history from Hegel to uh, Karl Rove uh, mm. like five minutes ago. And so it's funny you brought up Karl Rove, Tony, because yeah, I talked yeah. about him. I read that quote we're an empire now when we make you know you study what we do judiciously as you will and then yes. we go out and make new realities i read that to the students earlier today in q a because somebody asked about that so you weren't there tony that's legit synchronicity which is union the na nature approves of our endeavor no seriously <laughs> though i was turning around looking for this rosicrucian book because on the inside is the great seal of the united states and so when I picked up the book of the yard sale, I was like, oh, this looks like the thing on the back of the dollar. And, uh, you know, there, there are all these elements built in our society and we're not taught about any of them. So for someone like yourself to undertake the learning and, and stepping up to opportunities, like if LaRouche had a group there, you didn't have to go and participate and do research and actually get learned, but yeah. you did. Yeah, it's and a choice, right? We all make more, choices. Yeah, more people can do things like what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it really is just a matter of, I think, taking your destiny in your own hands. Like in a healthy society, I could imagine that we would all have access to proper educational experiences that would give us an ability to appreciate how our minds move when it's make, when they're being fruitful and making discoveries. That's great. And, and I hope to God and I have faith that in the future that will be what, what young people have access to. And we don't have that now. We were robbed of that. It's not our fault. We're born into a shitty situation. Um, but so it doesn't mean we're screwed. No, it means that all these great discoveries did happen. It's just that they've been obscured and kept from us. So we can, we have to do a little bit more work and pull up our sleeves to hunt things down like you guys do and, and read the original writings and, and, you know, just take our education into our own hands. You guys have created a platform here, which is wonderful where people can just come and really develop what they should have had access to this whole time. And I think Tony touching on what you were saying in terms of the resolution of this thing. Uh, that Karl Rove refuses to, uh, and all of the neocons just refuse. Um, it's, I think it has to do with this question of the subjective and objective, because these guys are kind of like voyeurs. They don't, they see themselves as shaping uh, a system that is other than them. They, other they're than from they like a higher elitist well class, right? <laughs> yeah, so well said. And they got these, these things that they, they're, they're convinced that all of us are mostly or prime, most of human beings are weak and thus are, are destined to be enslaved by the master elites, which mm -hmm. they must be because they're, they're the ones who are enslaving us. So they must be <laughs> genetically superior or something. So it's this dual dualism that they've got and they don't see themselves as part of the system that they're trying to deal with. Neither did Karl Popper in, in, in a serious way, even though he acts like he did, he didn't, uh, he did not. Um, with his theory of you know reflexivity and all that. Yeah, that's um, how, yeah, that's that's the issue, the re re recursiveness, and we get like hurdles theorems and stuff it. like that. The idea of being able to stand outside the system, in which but you cannot stand outside the system. You cannot stand outside the idea of a universe. You can't stand outside the oh. language we use to describe the ex experience of existence itself. Yet they deify concepts like cause and effect, or genetics, or uh, the or science itself, the methodology as being something that stands outside the system that they can use as a justification for the hegemony they're perpetuating on the people of the world. Yeah, they got their ivory tower I, a utopia of what they think the system should be that has right. no bearing in the thing that they're trying to manipulate. So they're imposing onto the thing artificially. Whereas um, I think that when you when you actually uh, look at somebody like like a like a Kepler again or, or you know even a Leibniz like read Leibniz's yeah. you know yeah, discourses Leibniz's on thing. metaphysics or something mm -hmm. and you can see that it's all about them train or Plato obviously and we're talking right. about Plato it's all about training the mind to think about thinking and think about what it what is the mind doing uh, which is interesting because now you haven't you're 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 trying to solve a problem which appears to be outside of you but it's all occurring in the mind. 
And so you go from a state of unknown to known, you make that, that discontinuous leap into like a Eureka. And now you have a new reference point of some of a, of the subjective inside of you and the objective outside of you. It's a discovery of something outside of you that it just happened. And no longer is there that wall between you and the universe. you you like just accessed an eternal, uh, an, yes. you know, like you, you access the form the way Kepler yeah, was able exactly. to showcase the forms and their geometric proportions in relation to Plato's Timaeus exactly. or in the yeah. idea of like ancient, you're not geometry supposed to know about this. Shut like, him up. Sacred you got a lot geometry. invested in this. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> knowledge, is, knowledge itself is only pervaded through secret societies, Matthew. You can't be doing that. That's, that's, right, that's right, the right. Yeah. and Freemasons are supposed to keep those secrets yeah. and hold yeah, that yeah, power. Just do some opium and go into a trance and then yeah. come to revelation or something. Yeah. You're, <laughs> not, you're, you're not supposed to be writing your own script in life you're supposed to be using the queen's script with all her pictures on it to to do all the stuff you know how dare yeah, you? Exactly. it's an interesting a good, a good sim character <laughs> juxtaposition you mentioned earlier about sort of the issues uh sarpy we were talking about the venetians and the, the sort of dualism but or this dual idea between do we suppress the information because in history that was the issue like, do we complete especially with the fall of the roman empire and it's moving over to east and byzantium and constantinople the suppression of information was so egregious i mean as, as china was going through the beginnings of like their golden age essentially a civilization we're going into a dark age and we look at like the progression of what happened as far as the suppression of knowledge and the suppression of even being able to allow to speak for example paris banned aristotle in like 1231 they banned his physics and his metaphysics or something like canceled. that and he got canceled yeah like the and like there's heresies against the new emerging what was being brought back from the, like the the sacking of constantinople and the crusades for uh and obviously we had the um uh the reformation that took place and then the counter-reformation and we have all these situations and then you thinking about but that was the strategy to your point that was the strategy for hundreds of years suppress 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 or only give a very few people uh you know maybe sort of uh, ascetic monks or people part of Charlemagne's court, um, the access to information in order to justify the faith in some capacity, the war against like uh, Tertullian or Anselm. But then there is this, they allow it to, it's, it gets out. It just starts to get out. You can't stop it. Then you have invention, the printing press, Gutenberg, 15th century, you have the Venetian, you have the Vicino translating all these different things, you have different cults sort of popping up around these ideas. You can't, you can't stop it anymore because then you'd, you'd be, you'd have to attack all of Europe at this point. It's, it's almost becoming too ubiquitous. So it's like, yeah, how do you spin it? In other words. And I wonder, is there a way to draw parallels to what we're experiencing today? Because on one level, I'm seeing individuals, young children being completely sort of like, I sort of alluded to earlier, they're not able to think, they're not being taught how their processes by how to think or how their own natural mind works, body, soul, mind complex works. Um, but at the same time, there's also this sort of like, I think about it is there's so much information being foisted upon us that we tend to just not even give into the information, I guess, or explore it. Instead, go for that call the dopamine drips, yeah, you know, yeah, the quick yeah. hits on YouTube. So it almost seems to be like a juxtaposition between the two still existing in modern times. Maybe I'm just like, way taking this way too far but maybe i'm trying to find an analogy where yeah you're going exists, way but, too far dude yeah, you can't right. talk about that stuff on this podcast but <laughs> it, it, it seems mysteries like both of are Osiris, happening. thousands of years old <laughs> supposedly that's what these people tell their people in the club but that's the thing on the dollar that i was talking about i did find the book it was just hiding behind yeah yeah that was that was brought in like 1932 right um uh henry wallace i think it was wallace that brought it in under fdr but that's a you know garage yeah, sale well, book Look at that. That was a garage sale book. That was a good fight. Um, Crucian, garage sale. You got to well, learn. Not for, let's say. not forget about what they did to Manly Palmer Hall. I mean, he became, oh, he was geez. forced to become a 33 degree Master Freemason. Of the and then mysteries. he, but then they, they, they sort of ritualistically murder him. I mean, he was a big guy. He had a lot of health problems, but That's, uh, I wasn't sure if, if Hall was a, uh, a psyop or not. Like, uh, yeah, it was never, I'm never, I've never been uh, clear on where he actually stood. He's a strange figure. He's another He's a weird guy. Figure. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I I read him like uh, like it, like I he's probably uh, lying. He's like a historian for things, the but saying things that are true at the same time. It's, yes. It's, uh, well, he's like a historian for the people, like for the you know the inner sect, if you will. So I look at it like almost like more of dubious form of quick because quickly was sort of a historian for the intersect so he didn't mean to be i mean he didn't, this dude, I don't know. He like I, I read his i i read his um his anglo-american establishment book and and he really it doesn't yeah. seem like he really sympathizes with the oligarchy what was that published about. though because rich one was he, that? after he died he after after died, so one yeah 81 yeah this um, Wonder, do we know when he wrote like when he began writing about because uh, my curious question is like we know yeah he wrote it in 1948 
It was 1940 when he wrote Anglo-American Establishment. Yeah, because Alfred Zimmer comes to him and he's like, here's this crazy story. And he's like, "Mm, I don't know if I'm going to go risk my career on your crazy story. I'm going to research it for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Then he's like, I got to tell people, but in a a way that's coded. So that was Tragedy and Hope. And then after I see, that's my question. It was coded with Tragedy. But to the Manly Palmer Hall aspect, I read this this book by Louis Sahagan, and it seems that he was ritually murdered. And some the ending's insane. Yeah, it's a bad ending. Mm. But he's an interesting guy. He's a Canadian mm. kind of Rosicrucian. He grew up with his grandmother, was his like basically who raised them. Uh, she encouraged him to raise book. And I came to this book after hearing probably a couple hundred hours of his lectures because he used to do a weekly 90 minute lecture. And then um, this woman, uh, she who remembers Jeannie Erstad, mm. had made this whole collection of all these radio broadcast from all these different people dave emery and you know manly palmer hall all these things that were out there so i just took it as raw material for consideration and here's this nice like older man who's like telling us the story of antiquity and i liked how he talked so i was like you know and then i'd look stuff up for myself but i didn't look at it like he's a source of uh, like the source he's just the messenger and in that message, there's things to pick up on and look up and, mm-hmm. oh, wow, they really did do this type of thing back then. Or I did, he said this book or whatever, you know, had this thing. So you go look it up and that's how you kind of weigh it. But mm-hmm. the establishment did not like him. Yeah. Was like of what they did at the end, like it was awful. Yeah. And was, I read, yeah. there's he a also lot got of it. marked pages in this yeah. book. Wow. I remember reading that set. You gave me that book and said, especially yeah. read the ending of it. And it was, yeah, it's pretty, he's a strange figure. He's enigmatic. Cause I agree, Matt. It's, it's, but he wrote this, Matthew, the secret destiny of America yeah. Yeah, which ties that. into Francis Bacon and you know, all that good stuff. That's another in issue. Frank, the new science is the mer- yeah, there's, there's Well, so Francis Bacon, there. but here's the, uh, see, I feel like we're, we don't have time to unpack. I know, <laughs> I know but it was like a good topics. first meeting. We made uh, lots of positive. Pro- I said, yeah, we don't have time to pack, unpack everything. But I think we can, around bacon we can have well. you back as a semi-regular yeah. guest and have more of these sure. conversations. Yeah. And uh, I also have some other like bigger, better ideas. But this was good because I was like, let's get them on the show. Let's showcase your work. Uh, let's point people toward the, the the articles, especially that you've written. But I enjoyed your uh, I enjoyed your interview with Whitney, like on a podcast. Fantastic. And then I enjoyed your debate with the other guy who was like, you know, uh, slightly different version of the theory. And, and he's trying to go back and forth with you in that debate. And I thought, oh. you know, do you <laughs> yeah, know I didn't know what I was yeah. walking into with that thing. But that was uh, yeah, that was that was interesting. I could see his side, but I could yeah. also see where the the incongruencies or the contradictions on his side would mesh with your story. So in the future, I think you guys are probably friends, but like he's yeah. coming in hot. He's like, no, but this. And I was like, this is what needs to be done. We need to get to the best ideas, the ones that, you know, absolutely uh, end up reflecting reality. And, yeah, I feel like on a different platform, if we were just like having a beer together, we'd, we'd hit it off just great. But I didn't expect that level of aggression coming into it. And I didn't even know what it was about. So <laughs> it kind of unsettled me. But yeah, no, I think this is good. And um, I just before I forget, one thing that you guys have to read, it's short. It's yeah. not a book I'm going to throw at you, but it's short. It's uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Eureka, mm. his thoughts on the material and spiritual universe. It's a prose poem, but oh, it's, it's prose. He wrote it a few months before he was killed in 1848. And it was the basis upon which it was like the manifesto, as he described it, for the new stylist magazine that he was going to create a few weeks after he died, because he was on the route back from Baltimore to New York, uh, where he had raised money, um, a lot of money from supporters who wanted to help him build this because he was always an editor for other people's magazines. And with the stylus, which he had the cover design, he drew it himself. He wrote out the manifesto that it was going to be about political analysis, historical analysis, poetry, pose, and cultural warfare. Interesting. It's that just like J.K. Like, Jr.'s George Magazine. It has nothing to do with... No, yeah, that, total I'm coincidence, sure. yeah. <laughs> and, and, this thing, too, when you read this, you're going to be struck by the fact that he is attacking two modes of thinking for the first 20 pages, the uh, the creeping and the crawling mode of a posteriori mm-hmm. and a priori methods of Euclid tu- and uh, the hog, Bacon. Uh, which mankind has been given uh, falsely as two methods of coming to truth and where one just creeps, the other crawls, but we are a species that is designed to soar. Um, that's why it's oh, called like Eureka. That. That's fantastic. I'm absolutely. Even cites right Kepler. Afterwards. He has a paragraph where he's translated Kepler's harmonies in it. 
it it's in it's intense and then he started getting a sense of kepler's why this laws guy was so huh? is very kepler's laws of motion i mean we, we we sort of deified newton around it and i get i you know but there's a reason why i think we sort of it's just the same reason we look at Einstein today. Like it's a certain celebrity around the way in which we artificially build up the like the historicities or the hagiographies, if you will, of these individuals, instead of recognizing the contributions that came before them that actually had, if you look into their work, there's something more that can be said. Oh, did I get, I got muted. Me too. Right, are we good? Sorry, okay. I don't know how to oh, you're good. You're good. Uh, but there's, my point is, I guess, you know, Webster Tarpley sort of alluded to this a little bit. It's the reason why I think we sort of focus on certain celebrity positions in history, the way we sort of like normalized history, if you will. And Newton being sort of, I get like he sort of codified the laws of motions in a certain, especially with the new calculus emerging, but it was born upon Kepler's laws of motion that are very interesting. But then Kepler had this, uh, to your point, this sort of a uh, more interesting way of looking at the mind and looking at the nature of discovery. Um, that because the, the issue of a priori and a posteriori, that'll never like the, the meeting point between the two is that truth is unknowable because where do you, how do you jump from the, the inductive to the deductive? I got this question all the time when I teach logic and it's like that, that issue there is where free will exists. And yeah. so what they say is that because of that free will, the truth is unknowable in some capacity because we're always sort of fallible. Of course, that presupposes truth is knowable. If you say it's to unknowable, think that's or not to think, thing. that is the question. And it's by an artificial the question, dichotomy. You start thinking. Yeah, you know, it's Good an point. artificial dichotomy. Good point. Um, yeah, this is fun. This is I didn't expect the conversation to go in this direction, but this is or yeah, these directions, yeah, and uh, this is great. I, uh, I had a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a good incredible work, mind, yeah. incredible work. Um, work. I just want to get this on the do your thing before I get his sites again at the end. Yeah, I was just gonna I was gonna put his sites on. So here's the Rising Tide Foundation. I have a bunch of tabs open because I want to read a bunch of oh, atomic sweet. physics and Luc Montagnier and the book review, The Nature of the Atom. That looks very interesting. And entropy. Oh, that's a mind blowing so, book. The Nature of the Atom, the the structured atomic model. Poof. I gotta check this out. Oh, man, I'm, I'm gonna be really great. Like your your website is sort of like become my main go to now for intellectual endeavors. Uh, awesome. We share a lot in common regards of the way you view history and society and, and philosophy too. I like the fact that you don't take such a in the, in conspiracy communities a lot of people take a very black and white position. Like they say, oh well, Strauss is connected with Plato and Popper sort of gives his analysis of the Republic or something. Therefore, Plato bad. And they just have this sort of initial sort of bias to it yeah. and this hasty generalization. And I'm like, you don't have that. Your website's filled with a lot of nuance. This is one. And the other one is your, the, this website here, the Canadian Patriot. If I'm not yeah. incorrect, yep. And that you can buy the books and yeah. yeah, just awesome work. I'm so glad that I got the chance to see uh, your presentation because I had no idea who you were as Rich alluded to before uh, the Reiner Fulmick uh, grand jury. So. Oh, and we're God, glad Ryan. to surprise you that you didn't know us either, but we got good things coming your way as well. So, well, yeah, no, you guys have been my radar for a while. I haven't really fully immersed myself, but I, I'm very, I'm very, very impressed. This is a, this is a good thing that you guys are doing. Well, right on. I oh, appreciate likewise. you. Like, and your stamina is astounding. The fact that you guys on a regular basis put out seven, eight hour pr productions. This is, is the uh, easiest part of my weekend. I lecture for seven hours on Friday night. I did five hours with the students today because I did an after show today. And now we're doing this. And then most of the week, I just, I'm off. I deal with clients. It, it's like I get a couple rest days, but this isn't my rest day. This is my. Work when you say you, you lecture students, what do you what do you lecture? Oh, I, I teach a course called Autonomy that basically puts back into our education that which they took out to make it schooling. So you put back in free will, critical right. thinking, creative problem solving, uh, active uh, literacy and rhetoric skills, and then high value skills of entrepreneurism or executive management. If you want to work in a company, either way, I teach like a uh, hundred students a season or a couple hundred a year, twice a year. I teach. So uh, we just started this Friday was the first lecture. So I'm still getting my, <clears throat> my stride back for doing all these productions. Getting the stamina back up. I mean, same thing. I mean, I took it two days off because <laughs> I had, I had a course I taught, I teach the GTW community logic uh, in the Aristotelian and Platonic framework. And I did like five or six hours and I'm, I was asleep the next two days. And then but Rich, I don't know. He does it. Yeah, Friday, this is all night. I, I, I'm really happy. What, what do you say? That, what's this community that you're, uh, that you're teaching? Okay, so um, Tony's course is for like uh, as well. it's for okay. members of the Grand Theft World, right? Because you're that you're members teaching. of the Grand Theft World and autonomy community. So it's right. Richard's Richard's community. It's both, but uh, I made it available because you know to make 
explicit the way in which they're lying to us and creating cognitive dissonance. I at least want to give people the basics of how, you know, in his, uh, Aristotle's like sophistical refutations against the sophists, how he outlined and defined, you know, these, these rhetorical techniques. And to your point earlier, one of the issues that the sophists did is they would essentially write out the arguments for individual, but they wouldn't show you how you arrived at argumentation itself. And that was his big critique is like, how do you even arrive at the nature of truth or the nature of being and all these sorts of ideas. So he wanted to give the tools for people to do that themselves. And that's what I'm I'm trying to get back. Wasn't it uh, Corax of Syracuse or Corax of Sicily that brought sophism to Greece Mm -hmm. in the first place? That's correct. Yeah. Corax. That is absolutely correct. Long train of abuses we have suffered. We got to learn our way out. Uh, Joshua, if you can hear me, will you send um, like the Freedom Vault in the Library of Cognitive Liberty to Matthew oh, yeah. sometime this week? Just like a mental. I was email. already sending him an uh, email. Thank you. Awesome. Sir. Cool. And I'll send you guys, uh, send me your, uh, your mailing addresses too. I'll send you a couple of signed copies of uh, The Clash of the Two Americas. And uh, mm-hmm. that should, I don't know. Probably I will read. So I will read and highlight them. Fantastic! Yeah, I believe awesome. you will. I, I when, when a lot of people tell me that, I'm like, yeah, sure. But I have yeah. seen your books, and I, I believe that you actually yeah. will. When I first met him ten years ago, I went through his library, and he has esoteric section of his library, and he has exoteric, and all, nearly every book had marks in it, and he had, and he labels like if you, Rich, you can oh, show he's like highlighted. He's, 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 he's a communist. Highlight it, you mean, he's, yeah. a, you mean he's, a, he's not a communist though, right? No, but, not, yeah, <laughs> different marks. That's why I was being clear. Good, good. He's got a sense of humor too. That's good. That's funny. But the whole thing was marked up. Yeah, wink, wink. So it was, he had the little red tape and he had a perfectly lined up going in a sort of linear fashion from top to bottom. That'd and then he honest. had everything marked. And I'm like, wow, he really did actually read all this stuff. I mean, a lot it's of it's to read it and still. not be able to remember it for recall. So I try to like give myself handles to do that. Either put it in my history blueprint or put some notes in the book. So it all comes back together. Yeah, it has to be punctuated with some, some, some meaning um, in the mind. <laughs> No, that's yeah. good. You guys are rare breeds. That's uh, that's good. Got to make this well, you, you yourself as well. I mean, your work is absolutely incredible. I mean, I, I had no idea about the Canadian connection or what happened with the, why it's always been a part essentially of the Commonwealth model and never sort of gained a sense of independence. As my dad likes to call it, like a sort of a franchisee of the crown. Um, I was like, yeah. you know, it's why it's not untrue. And you know, you appreciate. I think as an American, I've I've encountered a lot of American feedback when they've read my my Untold History of Canada books. Uh, you you kind of appreciate being an American or the American experience a little bit more when you yeah. look at the Canadian angle for like, in what the hell uh, happened here in this weird monarchy of the North. And this it's, it's like, and it, it's, it's a constitutionally organized deep state structure from the get go from 1774 in the Quebec act all the way to the present. Hudson Bay company. Hudson Bay company. Throw, mm. throw, We're throw, East yeah. India company down here. You're Hudson Bay company Hudson up Bay. there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the connection with especially what happened with uh, there's an article you have about the Greenbacks and the Lincoln, and then this is what happened around the Civil War too. That was an interesting. I had not was I was not quite as aware. I mean, I know Canada wasn't directly involved, but at least with the perpetrators or supposed perpetrators, there was a sort of connection between institutions and filter. I mean, it's just a weird. These are aspects I was not aware. Oh of. Oh man, but. no, it is so fascinating that Civil War period because mm-hmm. you have the Confederacy intelligence operations that are pro, that are all over Montreal, Toronto, and Halifax. I would never I mean, have thought that. No, and and a character, a key guy in this whole thing is George Saunders, um, a, a Confederate. Uh, I think he's a colonel. But he's like one of the key yeah, intelligence Sanders. operators up here. Huh? Not, not yeah. Sanders, Colonel so. Sanders. <laughs> I don't know if there's a direct connection. He actually looks a little bit like the guy, like the like the chicken guy. But uh, but he though. he was actually renowned for being because he was part of the, the Franklin Pierce government, which was like a young uh, Mazzini controlled Freemasonic government in the United States in the 1850s. And he was up there in uh, in Europe in Italy partying with Mazzini, oh, who man. had the whole Albert Pike connection. So, you know, you got these these different anarchists running the young the young Europe movement yeah. out of which Engels and Marx are are, are created to sabot- to sort of, you know, create a, a sabotage operation from the spread of the Frederick List American system um, political economy that was being adopted all over countries like Russia, Europe, everywhere uh, modeled on what Lincoln was doing with the greenbacks. And the whole protective tariff, long-term credit emissions, national banking, all of that, that's what was being disrupted by the Mazzini networks that were just weaponizing people and mobs. So yeah, the 19th just, century sort of 19th century British model that like when we talk about color revolutions, when I talk about what's going on, what happened with Ukraine, when I talk about what happened in Serbia or Egypt, or Syria, like I'm like, this is a model that goes back hun- like well over a hundred years to the absolutely. British State Department and Palmerston. And I mean, mm-hmm. it just 
incredible work and providing those connections really helped uh, sort of round out our perspective because we certainly have an American centric viewpoint, not because we, we just it's too much information. We need other people to provide their spe unique specialization. You've done incredible work. So kudos. Really. Appreciate yeah, we it. really appreciate it. Like there's uh, there's a lot of topics for people to dig into who are listening. And I always encourage them. If we said yes. something that you don't understand, look, start looking it up, start looking it up. That's where the learning starts. And um, I got some ideas what we could talk about next time. So uh, yeah, I think this is a good first workout and uh, a lot of value can be had from studying what we just unfolded in the past two hours. And that was spontaneous. Like I haven't talked, I haven't even emailed with Matthew. It was all kind of like done through Stephanie and Twitter and LD. And, you know, so uh, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. I think uh, there's a lot more we can learn from each other. And I look forward uh, to defending freedom and liberty for future as well as the present. Wise words to end on. That's good. Right on. Yeah, We're going to list your, your links honor. in the Thank show notes. Much. So people can click through, get your books, check out your articles, check out your site, keep up with you. And uh, thank you again for making time in your busy schedule. Have a good night. Hey, thanks for having me on. I look yeah. forward to the, to the next chat. Yeah, right absolutely. On. Me too. Thank you very much. Peace. Really so, great to meet you. Yeah, likewise.